powerfully stated, and I want to thank you for the sense of urgency that you um, made very clear at the end um, of your address. And uh, we will be with you on the front lines and have, and I know a lot of people in this room have um, been part of the blockheads as well. Um, so thank you for that note of urgency. Uh, very important. Um, and it is my pleasure now to introduce Pam Frank, um, who was the Ontario Campaigns and Government Relations Coordinator with the Canadian Federation of the Students. She joined the Ontario Federation of Labour as Director of Education and later became Director of Research. And in 2011, Pam wrote the OFL policy paper that recommended the Ontario Common Front. Um, and Pam is currently a graduate student at McMaster University in the Labour Studies program. We're very excited to have Pam here today. Well, I'm very honored to be part of this incredible panel, and I feel it's like a bit of a tough act to follow after uh, uh, Melissa spoke, so thank you so much for that. But I, I guess I'll just maybe pick up on the note you ended on, which is the, the question of the, the, the global environment and the planet and the totality of the systems that we live in. Because I think, to my mind, more than ever before, we need to see the big picture, and I think that's the slogan, think globally but act locally, is more important and more relevant today than ever before. And what I really wanted to kind of touch base on in, in, in my time here today was to really make a few basic points that, that may be a bit controversial, and hopefully we can have some discussions about that. But here's what I want to, I hear the, 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 the headlines of what I want to say. I want to suggest that neoliberalism is more than just an ideology that exists in the heads of people that we elect to uh, uh, implement uh, decisions on our behalf. I want to suggest that neoliberalism it actually has material roots and it's based in the global economy. And that global economy, I like to refer to as capitalism. So in other words, neoliberalism isn't just a malfunctioning, a moment of malfunctioning of the economic system, it's actually how the economic system functions. And, I, and, and we can thank Occupy, the Occupy movement for actually raising the slogan, capitalism isn't broken, it was built this way, as something that we need to take to heart. Because I think there is a reason why Occupy, the Occupy movement resonated, and it's because it gave us a way of talking about real dynamics in our system, that there is a 1% that, it, it, that wields extraordinary power over the 99%. And we may not all be clear about where we fit, in the, in the spectrum of, what, of the 99%, but we, most of us are pretty darn clear that we're not in the 1%. And that allows us to talk about class dynamics in a way that we haven't been able to talk about for some time. And that leads me to the second headline, and that is, it's not an accident that governments around the world are doing what they're doing. It's not just something, it's not that they drank the Kool-Aid, it's because there's real pressure on states to create the conditions that will allow capitalism to thrive. And in, a, in the current state of affairs, capitalism is not healthy. And so states are actually implement, are acting in the interest of corporations. In my view, states are not neutral entities. They're, they're bodies that actually intervene on behalf of the 1%. And anything we can extract from those bodies is a tremendous victory. But it's a product of us mobilizing and, uh, and, and organizing from below and putting those demands and extracting those concessions. And we need to know that once we win a concession, we have to re-win it and re-win it and re-win it. Because if we're not, the 1% is mobilizing to take it away. And I think that leads me to the, to the next headline, which is, it is urgent that we begin to rebuild those grassroots networks, those very networks that gave us those concessions, that allowed us to extract those concessions in you know, the so-called golden era that people harken back to in the years after World War II. Uh, the reason we got those is because we actually had an incredibly mobilized, uh, you know, uh, uh, subordinate class of people, uh, not just were not just unionized workers, but actually non-unionized workers, people who are not part of the one percent. The ninety-nine percent had a real practice of participatory solidarity, not just representative solidarity. 
and we need to rebuild those networks again. And we need, and, and it's it's going to be kind of hard work actually. And it's not going to be up, up and away. It's not going to be just you know the big exciting actions. It's going to be the hard day to day work of reaching our members wherever they are, engaging them, creating structures and mechanisms through which we can debate and argue and discuss and collectively learn and figure out and invent the, the ways forward that we can actually resist and fight effectively. And what that means, I think, is that we have to have tremendous faith in the capacity of ordinary people, uh, and, 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 and not only the capacity of ordinary people to affect change, but actually for us to really internalize that our fate lies with them. And that we cannot afford to take a shortcut thinking, well, it's okay to throw you know, one section of workers, maybe not in Canada, maybe in someplace else in the world, maybe it is a section of workers, or, or the poor, or the unemployed. We can't afford to throw anyone under the bus anymore in the hopes that we can get the right government elected, or the right set of people elected, and so forth. That strategy of sectionalism, whether that sectionalism is my workplace, or my union, or my city, or my community, or my country, or whatever it is that we think that we're, we're protecting, we actually need a strategy that says the totality. We need to we need to be in real solidarity with each other, no matter where we find ourselves. And that isn't easy. That's going to require a whole set of arguments, and it's going to mean standing up against the uh, racism and Islamophobia and homophobia and xenophobia that the powers that be that the one percent uses deliberately to divide us and frighten us and fragment us and make us not <laughs> because you know I was reading the, the business papers and uh, everyone is celebrating because apparently the Eurozone is out of recession. <laughs> That's good because just last year a tiny little country called Cyprus was threatening to bring down the whole of the European economy. Uh, so that particular crisis has stayed off and do you know what rate of growth is actually bringing the Eurozone countries out of recession? It's a rate of growth that is a whopping uh, three tenths of one percent. But it's actually negative because those are not overstated as well. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> exactly. And so I think, that, but that's the key point is that when you think about the, you know, Europe and when you think about the United States and when you think about China, those are the biggest economies or biggest economic zones in the world. And these are, economies are struggling. And in our globalized world, it means that uh, you know, growth slows when demand slows. And demand slows when either you know human beings can't absorb, can't profitably purchase everything that is being produced, whether it's corporations or whether it's individuals. And so when, when we hear people talk about slowing growth, what we're talking, what we need to be hearing is is a slowing demand. And so no amount of tax cuts implemented by Jim Flaherty or by the uh, the International Monetary Fund and its structural adjustment programs, no amount of tax cuts are going to create the confidence in corporations to think that if they invest a whole bunch of money in new production, that somehow there's going to be a booming market of people who are just lining up to buy it. Because the truth is, our wages have been cut, our consumption has been cut, and so forth, all around the world. This is something that's happening. And so corporations are stockpiling cash. They're not investing cash because they don't actually think it's going to be profitable. It's why we've had a financial crisis, because instead of investing profits and creating jobs and, and in new production and so forth, they invested in the financial market where gambling can inflate, literally more gambling in the financial markets can inflate the rate of profits. And that's why we're in the state of affairs that we're in. And I, I'm not saying that because you know, we all need to be economic brainiacs, but I'm saying that because what it ref represents is an enormous amount of pressure on corporate, from corporations on workers and on governments to create conditions in which workers will, uh, in which profit rates and growth can be restored. And what that means is brutal attacks on working people. It means brutal attacks on the environment. It means nothing can stand in the way uh, of, of extracting as much profit as possible. That means environmental regulations. That means attacking you know, indigenous nations that are they're actually standing up and trying to protect the environment and so forth. It means attacking trade unions that actually have a mechanism to allow workers to pool their financial resources so that we have the resources necessary to be able to fund the organizing work that we need to do. When we look around, it is not just you know, an ideological fight. They are the 1% the, the is actively organizing to try and undermine every fragment of organization that union and non-union workers and the poor and the unemployed have built over the past decades. And frankly, sisters and brothers, I believe it is the fight of our life 
to rebuild, to, to say no to those attacks, to rebuild the solidarity that's necessary, and to fortify the organizations that exist. Because, you know, we've all gotten pretty comfortable with representative solidarity where we go on to picket lines on behalf of other people and so forth. But how many of our neighbors are we bringing with us to those picket lines? How many of our co-workers and our fellow students are we bringing out to the Line 9 actions that are coming up and so forth? How many of us are spending weekends collecting signatures on petitions uh, and raising the issue of minimum wage so that we're raising up the, the most vulnerable workers? Because the other thing that the, the 99 or the 1% wants to do that one percent wants to do is is uh, is actually create communities of vulnerable workers, and the way they create communities of vulnerable workers is to actually do things like deny basic citizen and human rights to migrant workers. That's how you create a vulnerable community of workers. The other way that you create vulnerable communities of workers is when you cut people off welfare, or you reduce their benefits, or you drive people off employment insurance. There's yet another way of creating groups of vulnerable workers, and that's when you drive people off their land so that you separate them from their means of subsistence and from their traditional ways and so forth. This is all about creating vulnerability. It's all about creating scarcity and security when none of that needs to be. The world has more wealth than we've ever seen before. There is an appetite for solidarity that is being expressed all around the world, whether it's Greece, Turkey, Egypt, and so forth. Even though it's a difficult period that the Egyptians are going through right now, people are figuring it out and they're trying to resist in the face of humongous, uh, uh, humongous, uh, you know, and violent military intervention and so forth. But I do agree with, pre with what previous speakers have said. There's something in the air. People are reinventing solidarity. We've seen victories in, from the Quebec student strike, the Idle No More movement, that the actual the victories, are frankly, around the Enbridge pipeline. The fact that that pipeline, that that oil cannot be shipped. BC because of the <laughs> and likely to say no to shipping out of that dirty oil to the south. It really is up to us here in, in the rest of Canada to be the last stand to say that oil is not going to trespass on ours or any other community's territories. We have the ability to do that and I think it's a really critical step forward to making that possible. And thank you all so much for coming out today. And uh, I like, I, I think uh, one of the themes coming out here is, is one of, of, again, urgency, but also radical solidarity and the opportunities that are here for us. Thank you, Pam. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Michael Harrington. And I have to say, uh, being a worker in the education sector this past year, uh, I'm very eager to hear what Michael has to say about how they fought back in uh, Chicago. He is the director of union operations for the Chicago Teachers Union. He is responsible for the oversight of the union's external and internal communications, long-range planning and special projects, and the management of the union's administrative support and financial operations. Michael is a Chicago native and proud graduate of the Chicago Public Schools. He has a strong background of activism and accomplishment in local public policy issues and public education advocacy, and he is currently active, and I'm sure you are, uh, in the Chicago neighborhoods and local affairs. It's really fascinating to see what's happening on your side of the border. I hope my, to do my best to share with you what's happening to the South. Specifically, Chicago. Um, in, in 12 minutes, right? Um, first, let me explain, just this for, for, for context based knowledge. The Chicago Teachers Union just celebrated its 75th anniversary last year. Uh, we represent 30,000 teachers and education support personnel in the public, public schools in Chicago. And by extension, we also say, we represent the over 400,000 students in the public school system and their families and the communities in which those schools are located. Um, we, of course, on, on, on our side of the board, we call, we're talking about the, the, the right wing reforms, we're talking about reforms. And, and on your side of the board, and from the rest of the world, everybody uses the term austerity. And they actually mean a lot the same, they're similar to us. We're talking about those who have, and the, and the, the students heard me say this yesterday, those, those few who have the cake, 
who want the rest of us to fight over the crumbs. That's, that's basically what it means. And we see it manifesting itself in so many ways in Chicago, where our current mayor, Rob Emanuel, and the mayor before him, Mayor Staley, a couple mayors named Daly, uh, who've been busy privatizing components of the public school system, operations, increasing mandates for standardized testing, test preparation as a replacement for actual teaching. We've had a revolving door series of chief executive officers, CEOs for the public school systems, where we used to have years ago, actually, as educators and school superintendents were trained in education to leave the system. Right now, they're busy turning it over. You're turning it over in so many ways, parts parts of the education system to private corporations. We and everybody said, why are they attacking public schools? Why are why are teachers being being targeted all of a sudden so much? You know, the corporate interests in America finally figured it out about a decade ago, starting in the early 90s. Wait a minute, the public education budget in America, billions of dollars, was the last public government budget that corporations didn't get their hooks into. Mm -hmm. They got their hooks in the military. They got their hooks in social services. They got their hooks in so many things, public, public works. Got private corporations that figure ways to get those dollars too. Public education they hadn't touched. They finally figured out, well we can start inventing something called charter schools. We can start inventing the tests and the books that we create and grade and report on and issue back they're now figuring out ways to replace the humans in ways to get money back for them. So the public education budget now is, is the big target in our nation. Um, people keep asking what we've done, and you probably know we had this uh, teacher strike back in September where we shut the school system down with our 30,000 members, and it was a week and a half long. And people ask, how'd you do it? We hadn't had a strike in Chicago since the 80s, since the mid 80s. How'd you do it? Why did you do it? Um, the, the tactics and strategies in organizing to us are, you know, there's no real magic. There's no big special, there's no special secret sauce to what we do. It's, it's really basically hard work. You work hard, and we also say we like to play hard too, and we do in Chicago. Um, but the hard work starts with, some basic concepts from our leadership and Karen Lewis, our president, and the staff that, that she brought in to, to revitalize what had been a very moribund, tired, sleepy union for nearly 20, 30 years. Um, when she was elected to office three years ago, she brought in some important concepts that we pushed really hard, not only with our, our staff and our members, but citywide. It's, it seems real simple. She pushes honesty. She pushes transparency. She has a strong belief, we have a strong belief, in reminding members of the union that they are the union themselves, not just the officers, not just the staff, not the elected officials. Every member actually is a leader themselves. Um, we, one of the interesting things we did, one strategy, the, the mayors every other year or every year pronounce a series of schools to be closed all over the city, and we organized the earlier this year, we called it the three-day march across the city of Chicago, from the north side of Chicago to the south side of Chicago and to the west side. Three marches, 2,000 people went in the north, south, and west, converging on City Hall over the course of three days on the lakefront. The marches were walked the path of schools that were proposed to close. And we flyered in those communities, worked with people in those communities to help to turn out as marchers were approaching the school in the neighborhood that was being closed. You know, they closed schools that increase class sizes, save money, spend, spend it elsewhere instead of on education. But these three marches were a fantastic media spectacle of people, young and old, and, and uh, handicapped in wheelchairs and kids, and of course, school staff marching overnight over the course of three days. It took that long to march down to City Hall for a giant rally that we culminated everything in. Um, part of the act actions like that, um, 
happen because we spend a lot of time on coalition building. Very, 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 very important for us to talk about the people we're serving. We talk about the students and their families. When we went on strike, we didn't go on strike about wages. We didn't go on strike talking about the money that we know educators deserve. We went on strike talking about students' needs. We talked about the needs of students, so we were reaching out and spend specifically messaging is very important. We talked about the families that they were serving, the communities in which we were living. We talked about the schools that are anchors in communities. We didn't talk about one of the negotiation issues, which is, of course, salaries. That's on the list. We're honest about it. But the first message is about us as professionals serving your children, serving the kids that live in your community or that live next to you and your families. So one of the, the, the real thing to me is always talking about what are we doing in our communications? How are we positioning our issues in relation to the community's issues? We organized a citywide coalition of neighbors and community associations, civic associations, neighboring groups to come meet with the union on a regular basis every month. Um, there's a big meeting and there's several committee meetings during it. But we opened the doors of the Chicago Teachers Union to break bread with the neighbors, the folks in the city. We know we are combating mainstream mass media, which is created to exist to defend and explain those who own the cake. We do a big time job in educating the same public about our perspective on it. So in coalition building, we ask the residents, we've got ministers, we've got community leaders working with us regularly. What are your issues in the community? What are our issues at the teachers union? What are the issues in the schools? How can we work in coalition? So what we always have and what we help create is a very vigorous, vigorous parent advocacy that's happening on the north, south, and west sides. Not just schools primarily populated by children of low-income families, um, people of color, you know, it's racialized, which are real interesting. We talk about people of color on our side of the border. Um, but the, the, the citywide parent coalitions that have created now are they are black and they are white and they are brown. Um, and they've never existed before because we said we've got a lot of power as a union and we want to share with you. We want us to work together for the children. So we spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, God, there's so many more things and it's like less than I'm going to, okay, thank you. Um, but let me just say I'll be here to answer questions. I've got a lot of specific sites. Low wage, workers, women, racialized communities, and low-wage workers in precarious jobs, people that face discrimination and violations of women and labor rights. She's been active in a number of coalitions and projects aimed at mobilizing communities of color, immigrants, and women. And of course, she's on the Common Front Steering Committee. Uh, she's active in the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, her children's local school social justice committee, and has been teaching a community organizing practice course at Ryerson University. Her past work experience Hello, involves how are you doing? Good. Good. All right. You ready for some organizing? Yes. yes. Well, if you haven't got an action plan so far, um, I have another idea. I was actually sort of scheming when I was sort of sitting there thinking, Hmm, line nine, I think, is going to be on the social justice committee agenda of do some public school uh, this fall. So I think we have a lot of work to do, guys. Um, so I have been asked to speak about the minimum wage campaign. Um, now, you know, after our incredible speakers here this morning um, who've been talking about taking the big picture, the sort of total kind of... Uh, framework of what's going on, I am going to just kind of, because they have set the context, I think you have the picture, right? I'm going to kind of zero in on a campaign where you, we can get our hands dirty and do some real good bloody organizing in Ontario, in addition to the ideas that will come forward. So I'm going to just talk about the minimum wage campaign. Um, I'm not going to get into too much details because there is a workshop this afternoon, which... Uh, hopefully you're registered for. Um, but we've launched a minimum wage ca campaign in Ontario, fighting for $14 an hour. Um, we, uh, you know, 
July 17th, the, our lovely Ontario government um, announced a panel uh, that has been constituted to uh, recommend uh, how the what the minimum wage should be set at, and uh, and you know and whether or not the you know it should be indexed to inflation and, and how it should be determined. So there's a panel. Um, our Anthony Shelton is on the panel from the Ontario Federation of Labour, and the but the one of the key key sort of positions on this panel is. Anil Verma, who's the chair, he's the one that's going to write the report. Very short deadline, uh, six months, that they're going to be so-called consulting on this issue. But I think that, you know, when we're talking about building a movement, what's really critical from all these horrendous consultations and government processes that we know swallow up all of our time, that basically are a massive distraction, is because they are really a massive distraction from what we need to do, which is mobilizing our communities, our members, for what is our agenda. We're so often distracted by the agenda of government and what they're trying to basically take away, um, you know, undercut, <laughs> and we have no ability to sort of actually create a, a sort of a positive agenda for what we're trying to do. And so what I think it's, what's really important around all of this poverty consultation that's happening, all of these uh, committees on poverty, on minimum wage, is that at the end of the day, as we see, this committee is only gonna be, the chair will only be doing, the chair will be writing the report, not the committee. So the chair will be making recommendations, and it's up to the government to accept that, but really what it is up to is our it's up to our communities to push for $14 an hour, to push for a framework for what the minimum wage should be set at, that the government has no choice but to listen to what's happening. And that's only gonna come from building a strong movement in our communities around this. Now, right now, in terms of the model that we're using, I want to talk a little bit about process. Um, we have a steering committee that we've put in place that is running the campaign provincially, but really it's the local cities that have their own organizing committees, so it's centralized information, support, resources, but total local autonomy. So things where we can build in solidarity. And one of the things that we've seen since we've launched the campaign on March 21st is that there is incredible excitement around the province on working together, using the minimum wage campaign as a way to build alliances, build coalitions, build relationships where there haven't been relationships set before, and communities of low-wage workers and, and many, many workers who are contacting us are saying, yes, of course the minimum wage should be going up to $14. What's the question about it? And it's up to us to be organizing in our communities to do that. And on March 21st, we launched the campaign in 14 cities across the province. And right now we're mobilizing for actions every 14th of the month. $14, 14, get the picture? So every 14th, so it's not, it's not a, you know, if, if you've got a bad memory as I've gotten after the age of 40, no worries, it's 14. So that's all you have to remember. And so we did our first action last week, it was great. We had 10 cities participate. Mid-August, you know, people are a bit tired, but you know, we did 10 cities. We had um, a pots and pans rally in Ottawa. We had a pop-up street party in Kathleen Wynne's riding. We had street uh, theater uh, monopoly in Oshawa. We had pickets, we had leaflets. We had all different types of actions in, in Tim Hortons in the York region. All of these actions that took place across uh, cities last week, which generated not necessarily a lot of press in Toronto, but tons of press in the local communities, right? And so this is about trying to use this campaign as a way to inspire people to get together and organize on a very specific topic. So the response so far, I have to say, as from the media, because of course they are, um, can be brutal, right, on this stuff, is um, not bad at all, frankly. Um, we haven't had any pushback, really, no major pushback from the media. 
Um, a lot of uh, communities, local communities, are radio stations, local newspapers, totally, you know, pretty much on board. Um, even CTV, which is known for its lovely, you know, right-wing coverage sometimes, was actually pretty decent last week. Um, but I think what's happened is that we've been uh, first off the mark on this. We have our uh, organizing committees in place. We've had some fantastic uh, solidarity coalition meetings already. Um, we have strong networks in place. So you know what? We've got the framework to do a kick-ass campaign here. So it really is up to us. Um, now, I think that what I have to say is, you know, we don't see the minimum wage campaign as a be-all and end-all for, you know, resolving all the world, ills of the world, right? What this is, is, an, is a, a way for us to be building a movement where, again, we can be building relationships with community groups and with allies that we haven't done before. This provides a perfect opportunity. It's not a one-time campaign. We have to see this as a long-term uh, process. And I think as the speakers have talked about before, that do not see this as a minimum wage campaign. Do not see this, because this is we don't view this as a minimum wage campaign. We, yes, minimum wage campaign is the first thing on our agenda here, but what this is, is a chance to build a strong movement of low wage workers, communities, youth, students, unions, uh, racialized and immigrant communities that are fighting for decent jobs. Decent jobs and a dignity of life so that they don't have to bloody well go into debt and beg for the few dollars and be, you know, starving, right? So this is, this is what this is about, right? So, if that's the case, if that's the case that this is just the first leg in a building process, we have to do it right. So, you know, I've been doing this work for a while, right? 20 years or so. And so, like, let's not make the same mistakes here, people, <laughs> okay? Can we, can we ensure that we're reaching out to minimum wage workers in communities? Can we ensure that our committees are representative, that we actually have the communities that are struggling in poverty at the table, that they're the ones that are speaking out to the media, that they're the ones having decision-making control over the different types of actions, that we make events and actions fun and not boring and not have 15 million speakers at a rally that kind of kill us and you just want to just, I don't know, I just want to, yeah, so, you know, hear chalkboards sort of screeching. It's just painful. Can we please not make these same mistakes? Because you know what? We actually, the urgency that you hear from the panel today, I mean, it's really real. Like, you know, our wages and our working conditions and our jobs are deteriorating to such an extent that really this is this is sort of an, an opportunity to, to do some creative community building, to be bringing um, our respective groups together, and to really try and make a difference. And I would say with the to the unions in the room that you know as we are seeing, your bargaining at the table <laughs> is getting a little difficult. Raising wages needs community mobilizing and support. So if your members are making $16 and below, this, is, this campaign is a chance to raise your members' wages too, your benefits too. And in fact, instead of being reluctant about saying that your members are making low wages, recognize that in this in this age of bargaining, you need community working with you to raise wages and working conditions. They are union members. Just as non-unionized workers who are in temporary contract jobs need unions to stand with us to raise our wages and working conditions. Right? It's a two-way street. So, let's take some risks. Let's put some resources in. Let's do some creative organizing on the ground. Let's build some strong alliances. Again, not just some last minute kind of, you know, crazy ass meetings that happen the day before a bloody press conference and then you say, oh, we need a minimum wage worker. Who are we gonna get? 
let's have some real depth to the bloody organizing we're doing, okay, people? Because I know you're on it, right? We gotta do it right this time. And so, let's get out there, let's do some good organizing, education, let's debate, let's have some good discussions in our communities. We want you to take on the challenge, September 14th, taking on corporations, October 14th, Thanksgiving. Let's give thanks to organizing. Let's get out there and do some organizing in our communities. And November 14th, let's bloody send a message to our politicians that they cannot ignore. So let's, let's see you take on the challenge of doing the kind of organizing we really need to build the power of our movements. And let's, let's not repeat the mistakes. Thank you very much.